Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of Sketch Watch Play. I am John Flurry, And I'm Christopher Wade. And I have just told Chris, we're pulling a bit of a retcon with the episode numbers. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, before we did our what we considered our first proper episode, we did a test recording, which was a little more freeform. And I finished editing that and just put it up on the second episode. Second, <laughs> the second recording went up on SoundCloud. And mm-hmm. then I did a little more research and found that about Libsyn, which is apparently very good for podcast hosting and a lot more um, reliability and features. So I finished editing the test recording, and after listening to it, I actually thought it was good enough to qualify as kind of a pilot slash first episode. So that will be that is the first episode. The what we considered the first episode previously, where we talked about Dragon Ball Super and Paper Mario, is now episode two. And from this point, I think we will be easier to keep track of. This is episode three, awesome. and uh, I will start out before we get into our usual thing. How was your Thanksgiving, Chris? My Thanksgiving was great. <laughs> it was actually really laid back. Uh, I had a good time. I spent it with Serena and I spent it with my younger brother. We actually nice. went over to uh, we, we went over to Serena's parents' house for a while and we sat back in. Um, Serena, what did we watch for for Thanksgiving? Forrest Gump. We watched Forrest oh, Gump. That's a great movie. Great it movie. was perfect uh, pre Christmas movie. Yeah, I, I guess it's got, it feels like the right kind of movie to watch for Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I. I did what we usually do, which is kind of gather for a family reunion of my dad's side of the family mm-hmm. over this like kind of family shack we own in Leonardtown, Maryland. It's not yeah. fancy at all, but it's been – I think I told you about it before. Really, the one funny thing I'll say that was, was out of the ordinary, which was a day or two after Thanksgiving when I was just about to finish packing up and – drive home. Did you see the Facebook post I made? About, I think I did, yeah. Uh, I stayed with my grandmother, and white was coming out. We now think it was a Cooper Hawk that had flown and made a hole in her screen window on the porch, and couldn't awesome. find its way back out, and was flipping its shit, basically. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it was terrified, because, you know, it thought it was trapped. It probably, eventually, other family members, most notably my parents, uh, came out and tried to figure out what to do with it. And I'm sure it thought it was about to get eaten, and I was worried it was going to scratch someone fiercely because it, it was a bird of prey. It had those talons. And eventually my mom and dad got one of the uh, screen windows. They, like, screwdrivered it open and got the bird out. So all's well that ends well. I thought but, you were about to transition into uh, when your parents got it that they decided to keep it and train it to hunt, and it was your pet, and you named it Odin. That would be awesome. But oh. – uh I don't think that would work for one that's already lived in the wild for a while and was introduced to them through a really traumatizing event. That's okay. That's that's true. But yeah, yeah. But I, I, hey, it could always happen someday if they go to like a breeder. But yes. I yes. think right now we're content with the family has a dog at the farm that, that they have there. They have chickens. Yes. And this past year, my dad started uh, raising bees. Oh, that's cool. First thing I did when I heard about that, I showed him the Nicolas Cage clip. Ah. That's what I think of when I think of bees. Awesome. I'm a goof. But, I, was, um, I was about to say, obviously you let the bird go. Yeah. But I would have. I was about to say, let's not be too hasty. Think of your enemies. Think of the vengeance that you could you could bring upon them. Yeah. Well, my parents they're, they're not used to raising hawks. Oh. <laughs> we have a couple parakeets. Hawks are a different beast. Well, first time for everything. Parakeets, hawk. It's a natural evolution. True, but uh, maybe <laughs> a pet store, a pet store that sells hawks. Up it's okay. somewhere. So getting into what we've been uh, – what media we've been consuming. That sounds weird. What we've been playing and watching lately. Okay, let's th- get the big one out of the way. We've both started playing Final Fantasy XV, which released yeah! this past Tuesday. Insomnia Falls. The king was found dead. Okay, so I'm guessing you've enjoyed it so far. I've been enjoying it a lot. All right, you start. What are your, um, how much have you spent playing it, and what are your general thoughts so far? I actually picked it up on Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, so to be perfectly honest, I haven't play, played it that much. I had to work late up until about 11 o'clock the, um, the last night. Yeah. I played a good bit of it. Honestly, I'm not even that far in the main quest. I'm still in like the, the first gas station where you meet sexy uh, uh, Cindy or whatever her name is. It's Cindy, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm just rolling around with my my sexy hunk um, my sexy hunky boyfriends. Um, oh, you made that we, we made that tweet earlier today about Gladiolus. Like, yeah, I'm a straight male, but 
And I, yeah, I, I replied, like, it's really great that he is not a brute, not some big, dumb yeah. lummox like any character with that design would be. He's actually She's pretty cool. Just, uh, I, I'm, I'm as straight as they come, but that is an attractive man. <laughs> I, I'm, a little, I'm a little intimidated. Um, Pex, yeah, he's, he's but, uh, built. Serena had mentioned that uh, these are some of the things that I really like about the game. I mean, I'm, I haven't gotten that far into the story, mind you, and I know how how fast and loose Square can play with stories. Yeah. But there's a lot of subtlety in this game. And, uh, and by subtlety, I know subtlety is a really sophisticated word for video games, um, especially when it comes to Final Fantasy. Uh, yeah. But in this case, there are a lot of small touches that I really enjoy. For the past couple of Final Fantasies, it's been very linear. It's been very, go straight, here's a story. Go straight. Yeah. Here's a cutscene. That's the main complaint about Final Fantasy XIII. There was yeah. little to no exploration in that game. And this is, and and honestly, that's a big draw. That's a big drawback for a lot of Final Fantasy. Thirteen wasn't the first one to do it. It was just it didn't do it. I think people one. were expecting the move past at that point. Were disappointed when they didn't. Well, it it didn't disguise the linear the linearity very no, well. No villages just, or anything. Just weird. yeah. With this game, uh, so far. You see the giant expanse before you. You see yeah. the uh, right when you start the game, you can go into you can go straight in the side quests. You can just start driving around, do whatever the hell you want. Um, but there's also little touches in the characters. Now, never minding the fact that you can jump around and do tag team attacks. Right. But there are points when you're driving and uh, um, gladi- glad- uh, gladiolus. Uh, gla- Gladiolus. I was about to gladiolus. call gladiolus. <laughs> gladiolus. Okay. Yeah. I was about to call him Uncle Daddy Boyfriend because we. All- <laughs> Well, me and Serena have nicknames for these boyfriends. There's, oh, there's, I want to hear them. Yeah, there's Gladiolus, uh, w- w- which is Uncle Daddy Boyfriend. Right. Prompto, who is Little Buddy Boyfriend. Yeah. And then there's uh, Ignis, yeah. who is uh, British Butler Boyfriend. Um, That's accurate. And this is essentially a, bro- a venture where you're just going around just being boyfriends. And you I like one for that. Noctis? I don't have a nickname for Noctis. Not yet. I will give it figure time. One out. I- I- I'll give it time. I will figure one out. But... Um, there is one point where we're driving. Uncle Daddy Boyfriend is sitting in the back, and he picks up a book, rests yeah. his head on his hand, and crosses his legs. And it is it, it is such a good character moment. These are things that make my animator brain go effing bananas. There's going to be some cool fan art of this game, I think, just based yeah. on the character's little habits. I love the uh, photography feature. Yeah, that's and cool. And when I say that, it's not like a Pokemon Snap thing or like GTA or Watch Dogs where you, you do you manual selfies. Basically, mm-hmm. one interesting thing that it's linked to is to get experience and stuff, you have to do a go to a campsite. Yeah. You bas- you're basically banking experience up to that point. And then once mm-hmm. you go to camp and spend the night there because there's a day and night cycle, you're, that's when your guys get to level get to level up. And uh, Ignis, his tick is that he'll make uh, special dinners with stu- with ingredients you find or buy. And Which that can have like buffs and stuff. Thing. That it, is, it is the most adorable thing. Well, no, no, no. The most adorable thing is Prompto loves to take photos. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. He... There are, there, I mean, there are, I mean, there's certainly cut scenes for like when you first get your car repaired. He's like, let's all take a picture of the four of us. But every time a day ends, at some point, the game automatically takes. I think it's like ten per day photos of uh, char- the characters posing, locations you visit, or key moments with characters, yeah. or even just certain points in battle when you're actually playing it. And then you can pick them and like save them to a to a role you have over time. Uh, I don't know if there's like a directly upload to Twitter or anything, but with PS4 yeah. share and Xbox share, that's pretty easy either way. <laughs> and it's just a cute, fe- and you even, it even levels up. Like, yeah, that's cool. Like, I think it's um, Ignis levels up when he cooks. Uh, yeah. Uh, Prompto levels up when he uh, when he's taking with these all the photos. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's his name? Noctis. Well, can, there's a fishing mini game, of course. He levels up fishing, and I'm actually trying. I'm trying I don't remember what Gladi Gladiolus is. It's like scouting or something. Maybe it comes from okay. exploration. I might be wrong about that. And that's it's, that's a cute thing because uh, Noctis is the only one you directly control. It's mm-hmm. because the game's uh, real time actually it takes the Kingdom Hearts approach, and you're the guys who are CPU. Though you can activate their special skills manually, and Noctis takes part in them. Yeah. So it's still kind of a nice way of making them feel like fleshed out party members and not just characters. Yeah. And that's that's definitely true. I mean, I like the approach that the narrative is taking with these characters so far. Instead of just going down, like I said before, instead of just going down a linear path, the game is telling you this is a story about you and your bros. This is a story about you 
going on an adventure and learning more about your world instead of just here's the adventure find out uh, find out about these colorful characters it's- well there's also the fact that in most final fantasies the characters are meeting each other for the first time usually these guys yeah. have known each other for years yeah and that's it's that, like, that's like- i've start i'm about to watch the uh, brotherhood shorts they did cuz that kind yeah. of much like kingsglaive which we'll get to in a second that's all about fleshing out the backstory i think cuz i think they don't want to bog the game down with it yeah and they've Which, Noctis has known these guys for quite a while, so that, that was a good a decision. We, we honestly could be talking about Final, Fan, um, Final Fantasy 15 for quite some time. It's, I think we're going to because it's a yeah. pretty long game, and and I think we'll revisit games from time to time in our opening session. I I will say I will let you know. Do you know that it gets more linear in the missions later on? Yeah, I heard it does get more linear. Which Basically, is like the open world remains, and mm-hmm. apparently you can always go back to it. But I think mm-hmm. they do you know kind of more GTA approach where once you start getting into certain quests, they are like specialized areas for it that are more linear with restrictions and stuff. And I'm hearing both good and bad opinions about it, so I think it'll be interesting and see how our opinions of the cha- game uh, change or even stay the same as we get yeah. into it. As it um, yeah, de- definitely. As it stands right now, I'm, I'm loving the game. Again, I haven't really gotten that far into it, but yeah. I like the initial presentation of it. it, it yeah. I'm really impressed by it. I think, like, if you look at the reviews, even the more negative ones are saying, like, this game nails the character dynamics. Mm-hmm. It feels very fun and very um, nuanced in some ways, like you were talking mm-hmm. about. Just mm-hmm. the things they say, that it fits each of them, and it builds on things in cute ways. Oh, yeah. and I don't think I'm the only one who thought this, because I Googled it. It's the inner nerd in me. They, they remind me of the Ninja Turtles. They do. They're, they're, they're super dorky, and they're well, super... They're archetypes. Like, uh, yeah. Prompto is Mikey. He's the j- dumb joker. Ignis mm-hmm. is Don. He's the brains. Gladiolus yeah. is Raphael, the tough brawn. And uh, Ignis is Leo, the stoic leader. Yeah, and it's and it's good. I, I yeah. like it a lot. And it's not a bad I, thing. Those are those are archetypes and other and tons of other stuff. I don't. Th- I doubt Square was like, we got to draw inspiration from Ninja Turtles for this. <laughs> I doubt that too. Um, yeah. But, but to some degree, a, I do. Uh, to some degree, I do think that they had a good thing once they figured out that this was going to be a road trip RPG for quite some time. Yeah, um, that was a really good decision. And actually, um, I read the other day, it's already the fastest selling title in the series history. It's sold it 5 be. million units already. Yeah. It's, and considering it's very, what a crazy development industry it had and how much money they must have sunk into it, I'm glad it seems to be paying off in that regard. Yeah, me too. Uh, for now, let's go ahead and move on, if right. you like. So we but, have both, I actually, to prepare for uh, 15, I watched uh, the tie-in CG movie, Kingsglaive, and you told me you watched it as well. Yeah. And... Um, well, so I've seen all three Final Fantasy CG movies, and mm. I'd actually say, in terms of ones that work more than they don't, they're only one for three, because I do like Advent Children. Mm-hmm. Uh, Spirits Within kind of sucked. And I'll just say right now, Kingslave uh, looked beautiful. Uh, mm-hmm. First act two I thought was garbage. Like a lot of writing cliches, some Definitely. of the side characters had the bad voice acting. Then once the, you know, it actually started to incorporate the main plot, it was still the plot was hard to follow and all over the place. Mm-hmm. But it was giving me more that I was interested in. And I think it actually does work as a companion piece, but certainly not as a standalone plot. Yeah, plot. when I bought the Deluxe Edition, I felt kinda of, I felt a bit disappointed and a little cheated in that regard because when I Listening to the music, and the, the music has been a big draw for me in 15 for quite mm-hmm. some time, I was kind of hoping that the music, the soundtrack, would come with the deluxe edition. Obviously, it didn't. It came with the movie, which I thought was a nice surprise. But unfortunately, mm, like you said, it's very impressive visually. I think they did a lot of motion capture things that just blows Advent Children out of the water. Yeah, it's gorgeous. So, yeah. And it's, I, I will say... Even even Advent Children as well, like Square has have become such good masters at avoiding the uncanny valley, but still yeah. making really realistic uh, human characters. In fact, I noticed the character of Luna Freya, she actually looks more like, her design is way more grounded in Kingsclave. It's less traditional, j yeah. property, more like a regular person. She definitely looks like, she definitely has a, little, a bit of a decoding fanning uh, f- face going on in Kingsclave, which I thought was fine. I do like the westernization kind of draw that Kingsclave have. However, to get to your point about the cliches, it is heavily cliched. Like the, yeah. one, of the, one of the first cliched things that they do in Kingsclave, and spoiler alert, here it comes, is that they kill a character's mom, which is... Yeah. The most cliche thing that you can do in an RPG, but at the same he's time, he's flashing back to it, and I'm like, "Come on!" 
Yeah. Oh, uh, not, not only that, but she dies so quickly. Like it's she's only in one shot. She barely has a line, and then it's like, yeah. well, some fire in your they, face. They don't do a good job of fleshing out the main character, uh, Nix. Even though I like that he was voiced by Aaron Paul. Like other than that, we don't know anything about him. He's just co- generic action, he- noble action hero who sounds like Jesse Pinkman. Yeah. The um, the thing about um, Kingsglaive is that it's weighed down by that main character. That's it's a big weighed problem, down yeah. by it's made down uh, weighed down by a bunch of other things. Uh, with some hit or miss voice acting, um, actually, I thought like have, the 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 Kingsglaive girl character in the first third, her she sounds so forced. Um, she, she was the main offense to me, and then uh, there were, like talking, other bit talking, players who sounded weird. You're talking about Crow, right? Yeah, yeah, I did not actually, like the voice acting. Rough day on the gate, Hugglave. You jerk! It's your fault he got stuck there. Ah, not a very nice welcome for a big hero. Not a very nice outfit for one either. Hey, Libertus, you think Nick's for saving your life yet? Oh, come on, Crow. Nix and I are too close for that. Uh, I actually liked Crow. Um, I think that she could have had a more restrained performance in how she no, was delivered. the character was fine. I'm talking about whoever was doing her dialogue was... Well, that's that's what I'm saying. Like, okay. whoever was doing her dialogue, I felt that she could, uh, she could restrain her performance just a little bit more. Yeah. Um, however, I could have lived with that. What I couldn't live with is the fact that the movie killed her. <laughs> yeah, so, we're, okay, we're already dropping. Yeah, she dies... Uh, like at the end of the first act, it's kind of keep. Yeah, going. I I feel like the the movie out and out goes out of its way to tell us that Nix, the main character, who I like to call, let's see, uh, Mister McMullet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the movie tries very hard to make him feel interesting, but he's not. In fact, every other character in this film, even if they have hit or miss voice that voice acting and they're not properly motivated, mm-hmm. they still have better motivations. And the reason yeah. be- the reason behind that is because you feel what has happened to them. Like yeah, with they, the, they talk about what motivates Crow and like the other soldier who's kind of like yeah. a big brother figure. They talk about um, why the king is doing what he does and Luna Freya. Yeah. Nick's just kind of goes along with things. Well, Nix Nix goes along with it, and you get the sense that he's he's dealing with some internal brooding issues and whatever. Like my sister died, or or some. Yeah, some, it doesn't get across bullshit. very well. Well, it's not that it didn't get across very well. Like I knew that was coming, but every time it happened, I was like, "Well, Liberty has just lost his uh, little sister figure, and he's bawling his eyes out." Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of people are, are are saying that they don't like his voice acting, and some of that's justified. But at I the same right. time, um, but at the same time, I'm like, he's still a better character. Yeah, like, he has he has more motivation, and conflict to him. Oh, and yeah. actually, I'll also say like. Just some of this plot I found hard to follow. Like it's very they, were connect, they were connecting him to the attacks that happened, but he wasn't. Yeah. But he was with this group that was. And it's, then like all these statues start coming to life at the end, fighting each other. I'm like, why? How? I I think it's because <laughs> it's just, of the powers Nick's got, but they don't they don't clarify. They don't, well, well, the the giant statues are I I guess are from uh, have been referred to as the old wall. They're not exactly a wall in a traditional sense. But they're a defense they're, mechanism. Yeah, they're a defense mechanism yeah. in case all the other defenses have fallen. Yeah, I, I got no I, hints, no clues about that, though. I mean, uh, they, they showed them here and there, like, yeah. in, in brief Static. spots. I'm like, that's a statue. That's right. a statue. Right. That's a statue. And then the movie's like, now the statues are alive! That's, that's what I mean. We didn't really get a good explanation for why they were moving when they were just <laughs> static. With the but I guess if you Googled Wikipedia and stuff, but th- th- you shouldn't have to wiki that kind of stuff. Yeah, you, you kind of shouldn't have to, but I, I, I'm a firm believer that a movie should not have to hold your hand throughout everything. And I guess the movie thought that it wasn't. However, um... It could drop. It could have dropped a few more hints here and there. Uh, yeah, I don't things um, things of that nature would are pulling those kind of surprises out, out of their pants. I don't think those are necessarily bad things. They they could they could be sloppy things that we could easily forgive if the characters were more interesting, or rather, if the main character was more interesting. Yeah. There are a lot of times when I wanted to, uh, or or I wanted to, or I wanted to get to know. Uh, General Glaucus's backstory. Yeah, and he was got, a badass villain. And you got he, some of his motivation. Yeah, not his backstory. Um, there was also the point where the movie introduces uh, three places, it intru- or three kingdoms, mind you. It introduces Niflheim or Niflheim. Yeah, and uh, introduces Tenenbra. I love these names; they're great names. <laughs> yeah, um, and it also introduces the kingdom of was it Lucius? Was the kingdom I think of- so? Yeah, the kingdom of Luscious. Um, I did that on purpose. Yeah, I did that on purpose, mind you. Okay. But then it talks about refugees out of nowhere. And as I'm watching the film, I'm like, oh, these are the refugees out of Tenenbra. And the movie's like, no, these are the, these are the refugees from another place called Galahad or something. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, and I'm like, what? When did when did that happen? That well, that, I mean, they they established that the, everything outside of uh, Lucius has kind of been torn up by the war. Like it's kind yeah. of the last safe hold from this place. Yeah, but that's so people are moving. Yeah, but that's something you kind of have to assume as a as a new person getting introduced to this world because this place, this this world of Final Fantasy 15 is extremely dense. Some of it you can follow. As long as you have characters that can that are fun or easy enough to understand to guide you through it, and that's what I think works well with Fifteen the game and how King's Glade kind of fails in that regard. Yeah, you have really fun characters who are traveling the world and kind of discovering it a little bit more and learning about themselves as you are, and it does yeah, that yeah. really well, even with exposition. King's Glaive, which I think had a pretty good way of explaining some of the core parts of its world, mm-hmm. just threw that out the window in lieu of a very, uh, gen- well, a, a very cold, I don't want to call him cold, but a very, a very cool as a cucumber, co- calm and collected and confident Assassin's, Street, Assassin's Creed protagonist at some yeah, point. Yeah, he would fit into that. You're right. But I to, to stress the positives, I actually did think once like the all the setup in the first act out the way, I did find some of the political parts kind of interesting, like the coup oh, later on. And oh, I will say, I actually do really like the uh, the main villain's okay, but that that cocky hat one who shows yeah. up. Yeah. Oh, he's just so fun because he's just it's, it's it's a very cliche scene where he kinds up and says like, "Hey, all you got to do for peace is surrender." But the way this guy's delivering and the way he's animated, just <laughs> I like yeah. that. Yeah. Hello! Good day to you. And you? Well met, my dear Lucians. It is an honor to be recognized by the great King Regis. He, apparently, he's, he, apparently he is like the main villain of the actual game. He, he's, uh, I don't know um, if the guy with the hat, is he, if he's the main villain of the, actually, uh, of the actual game, I'd be surprised. I think, uh, well, I think he's either, he either shares it with the main emperor guy or maybe maybe he pulls a Kefka later on. I don't know. I maybe. just looked him up on the Fantasy Fantasy Wiki and he says being antagonist. He might share duties. We'll see what happens. Yeah, uh, we'll see. I, I will kinda... say um, I looked up his voice actors for fun mm-hmm. and it's, uh, it's Reinhardt from Overwatch. Oh, cool. And then I tweeted the guy and I was like, hey, it's Reinhardt. And he was like, he responded like, yeah, it's been a busy year. <laughs> good for him if you look around uh, on youtube he loves to like hang out with fans and do reinhardt quotes and stuff seems like I'm a good guy yeah sure i'll follow him i i i i love those kinds of characters i i like that guy from yeah. king's glaive i like the the emperor aldergast i i like the i like the old evil guy <laughs> i, I sent a picture of him to my mom because I, she's a huge hunger games fan mm-hmm. and i was getting major president snow vibes from his design and yeah. motivations I, I like uh sean bean's character he was the yep. king right yes he was well, we and, all know uh, what's going to happen to him. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's really that much of a spoiler that about what happens to the king because it's been the promotional material. Yeah, by the time the game starts, it's already happened. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm kind of curious to see what they do with Luna in the in the game because she's kind of more of a noble damsel in distress in this, and I have no idea how that, that <sighs> the game just that was paced that. That was also extremely disappointing about King's Glaive because she has such a wonderful design, and then to kind of squander it by giving her giving the the results of her motivation to Nyx, the main yeah. character, where she's she's and she's and she's bound by her duty and she's bound by destiny. Well, yeah, these are so things. many of her scenes. I swear you could just sum it up by Nyx or someone else saying, "Stay here, hide here." Yeah, Run. yeah. And and what I really hated about King's Glaive is that the movie, in no subtle way, reminds you that he's the hero. He has some pretty good lines, but at the same time. When Nyx outright stops the princess from putting on the ring that could quite possibly change everything, he's like, no, I'll have the ring. Didn't anyone tell you? I'm the hero. And I'm, I rolled my eyes. Wait, did so- he say that? Oh, he didn't literally say I'm the hero, did he? Yes. <laughs> oh, shit. I forgot about that. <laughs> it was right. terrible. Yeah, I'll take- wow, that is pretty on the nose. It was very shoehorned, and I think that... That sounds shoehorned, yeah. Yeah, and I think that along with the fact that this guy's design is very archetypal and very stereotypical of yeah. going through the, the the marketing branding machine of what gamers like in their characters, it's one of those things where I wish Square could have taken a more creative risk. Because when I say that uh, someone like Libertus or someone like uh, fucking, I don't know, King Regis, or even yeah. Crow, or, or even the Princess... When I say that one of them could easily be the main character, they're much more interesting in that regard. And I think that that's King's Glaive's most dire flaw here. Yeah, so that, I'll sum it up because we should move on to our, to our main review. But I'll sum it up by saying 
I think it's good as a companion piece, but it should not be the only... You should not watch it if you're not planning to play Final Fantasy XV. Yeah, absolutely not. Unless you find it for free somewhere. And actually, the only reason I ended up getting it was because I got... I There was a PlayStation Store deal going on where it was like, you paid $100 last month, here's $10, $15 store credit. And like a day before, I, I got a message on PSN from Square Enix saying, buy Kingsley for five bucks. So... <laughs> It's an all right price. It's uh, visually, it's a good movie, and I think yes. that it's worth supporting the the actors and the artists who worked on it. But yes. as as a movie, as a film by itself, objectively, I'm not happy with as it. As a narrative, it is far too flawed to recommend in that regard. E- now, e- you can buy the soundtrack. <laughs> that's, no, that's, no, actually, you can you can play the soundtrack on your car in uh, 15. Yeah, that's cool. I like I that. I love that you can buy uh, old soundtracks uh, to like. I'm waiting for to find uh, the six and ten soundtracks. Those are my favorite in the series. Cool. But uh, anyway, I'm going to uh, pause so we can save this recording, and then we will move on to the main event. I'm going to preface this review by saying, you've heard the saying, don't judge a book by its cover. That doesn't just extend to a product itself, like a movie, but also how it's promoted to you, because I have never been so wrong about, at least mainly mainly the first one, uh, as a series. I thought the moment the Country Panda was announced, when I saw the trailers and the posters, that it was going to be terrible, because... I still don't like the title. It's a very generic title. I like Jack Black, but he's not a esteemed actor. He's a comedic one. And I, from the moment I've seen trailers that I remember, they just didn't emphasize. Now, Chris, I know you picked this because you're actually, we're, I think we're both generally fans of this series. Mm-hmm. And I just remember all three movies, they don't tell, show you what makes these movies great. They don't show you the the best comic moments. They don't show you how good the animation, the fight choreography gets. They don't show you the emotional beats. They don't show you anything that makes them clever and endearing. And it's, I think it actually is my favorite DreamWorks series. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can, I can definitely agree with that. I definitely underestimated Kung Fu Panda a great deal. And just to give you some context... When Kung Fu Panda was first announced, I was already jotting down ideas for a panda-based animation idea. (laughs) So when I heard about it, I was like, God damn it. And I said, never. I will never watch this thing. And I was so upset. And then I watched it. I didn't didn't see it in the theater. I watched watched it like a year later. And it, it was one of the greatest animated things i had seen in a long time in that cg animated period like yeah when it came out there was like a weird lull and how good dreamworks cg films were they just weren't good no <laughs> they, and they, they they've always had a spotty track record with me sometimes they'll do something great and sometimes they'll do something mediocre or bad that's never really stopped and i had uh, long assumed this was going to be a bad one judging by the concept and even the early teasers mm-hmm. then i saw reviews for it and that convinced me to give it a shot, and I'm very glad I did. It was just a very surprisingly good comedic, emotional ride. Uh, the, yeah. um, the very first one. It, um, the guy, the guys who directed that one, that was Mark Os- Osborne, and I'm sorry, Mark Osborne, and who else? Um, uh, I will look it up. But yeah. uh, I mentioned Mark Osborne to you last time. Yeah. He is a very underappreciated animation director. I think mm-hmm. part of that is because he's only done two feature films and yeah. a lot of stuff on the side. Okay, the other one was a guy named John Stevenson. Yeah. Who I'm trying to see if he's actually directed anything else. <laughs> he was originally set to direct that He Man remake they've been trying to do for years. Uh, and what? now he's apparently going to do something based on Noah's Ark, which was. Oh, like, that's okay. Good. Okay, let me see what he, if he's directed anything else. Director. He directed... That is his only uh, feature film. He, uh, he's oh, done okay. shorts and some TV stuff and a lot of other behind-the-scenes elements and various things. Some well, good, he, some bad. Like, he worked on he, uh, James Giant Peach, good movie. Ferngully 2, bad movie. Yeah. <laughs> also, oh, he worked on a lot of Jim Henson stuff. Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, Great Muppet Caper. So he's been going for a while. Yeah, that's that's all well and good. These guys uh, definitely delivered something something really special in regards to Kung Fu Panda. I mean, yeah. just being able, 
I had never eaten so much crow. <laughs> so no, me too. Quickly. Yeah, I would still do. Uh, so quickly, and then when that first animated sequence by James Baxter of all people, James the two D animated Baxter. sequence of uh, of Poe just walking along and then beating the crap out of folks, yeah. anime style. The and, the two D portions like that are like dream sequences or fantasies in the first two movies are incredible. Look, yes, not just it, the animation. The style is out of this world. It it's blew my nuts. Mind. I, and and I think that first animated sequence in the first movie that's After Effects. I I, I believe it, so. It looks kind of vector based at points, but it, it looks awesome. And yeah. actually, have you ever seen any of the uh, the featurettes they put on the DVDs? I did. So watch some of the featurettes on on Kung Fu Panda One. I didn't see them on Kung Fu Panda. They did. Too. Okay, so the fir- for the first one they did the like the origin stories of Furious Five. Ah, you know what? Flip that. I did see it. Um, uh, I I did see them for Kung Fu Panda. Secret of the Masters. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that that's all in that style. Looks great. Then the second one, they do the origins of those uh, those masters guarding the city, the rhino, croc, yeah, and the ox. I remember that one. Also gorgeous. Yeah, some really some, cool looking. Some really good animation in those. Yeah, uh, and actually, not to discredit the CG stuff because oh, it's holy cow, man! I, just the, the environments, the staging, just the way the camera is shot. The, the shot composition and the colors that they used in the first movie were pretty out of this world. There, there was a very specific sense that you got from the directors that, yes, uh, when you're in feature animation, you do have a very specific coloring style or a color theory that you want to adhere yeah. to or rules that you want to build. These guys definitely had an idea of what they, not only what they wanted to do with color, not only what they wanted to do with transitions, but also what, uh, what they wanted to do with pacing. They took a lot of their time building up not just Poe, but surprisingly, uh, Master Shifu. Yeah, and you Master mentioned Shifu. this to me earlier. Uh, Shifu is my favorite character in the series. He's absolutely. And the first I, movie is just as much about him as it is Poe. Yeah. Because and, the main thread of the movie is him kind of basically having to confront his biggest inner demon. Yeah. And by that point, there have not been a lot of CG animated affairs that have that have honed in on that kind of inner tor- and turmoil that adults have in an yeah. um, animated feature. Only when feature. they come to my mind that would be out by then was The Incredibles. And that was a still Incred- different kind of turmoil. The Incredibles, and I think not. Uh, I think either before or after How to Train Your Dragon. How to Train Your Dragon was really good, too. Yeah, that was after. That's the other my, my other favorites. Yeah, that's that, that's another podcast. But with Kung Fu Panda, the, the, the relationship between Poe and Shifu you felt throughout the entire film, whether or not Shifu was beating the crap out of Poe or wh- whether or not um, Poe wanted to stay um, yeah. he definitely wanted to stay, but then how much Shifu just hates him and just wants to leave so bad, but then yeah. he kind of, kind of starts to recognize his dedication and passion mm-hmm. for everything, and, and then and how that, and how he actually had does have his own um, benefits to his who he is. Definitely, and and the the dynamic is switched, and that's what that's where Kung Fu Panda One shines the most. I mean, it shines in a lot of ways. It does yeah. a good job of introducing the Furious Five. It does a good job of honing in on the presence. Of Tai Long, you don't yeah. even have to see Tai Long, and everyone is crapping their pants. Like halfway through the movie, but yeah. you know, you know, you already know by then how much people fear him. There's a grand use of, of, of very strong blues and contrasting power color reds to, to be able to show like what Tai Long is about. And when he first shows up and just destroys the, the rhino, it's amazing. And, and, oh, when he's running up, stalactites falling yes! down. Like they they throw everything at him, and he just can't be. He's a force of nature. You see all the fear that all the characters felt in that character just explode once Tai Long actually sets foot into the movie, and that's yeah. that, that in of itself is a very strong part of why I hold Kung Fu Panda One in such hard high regard. Yeah. To, and, I mean, going further into Tai Lung, like, I think, well, so we'll get to the other two, but one of the things yeah. you mentioned, uh, you, like, you said all the third and less high regard, the first two, their villains are so well thought out. Yeah. Because they both have, you know, very, they've made some huge mistakes, mm-hmm. and they think, they're, they're, it's not even for them, for, for Tai Lung and for uh, Shen. Yeah, they're not seeking redemption. They're just trying to gratify themselves, and you know what they think it will reclaim their past glory. Uh, because Tai Lung, you know, it's all about that dragon scroll. He's just he's he's he is power hungry in the end, yeah. and also immature and angry because they you know the reason he was locked up is because he went on a rampage when he didn't get what he wanted. That's yeah, true. Yeah. And Shen does because he's you know he that prologue he's greedy and he does something horrible. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, it's one of those things where, you know, they can't go too into it because it kids move. But basically, he commits genocide. 
Yeah, basically. Wipes out almost the entire clan of, of pandas who didn't do a single thing to him. And then so, later on, um, the best thing is, I love that part with uh, the soothsayer because that's, there, there's one part where you can tell Shen almost, there's almost a glimmer of him realizing what he's doing is wrong. Yeah. Because that's, he has these silent moment, but then he's like, no, I'm, I'm going full ahead with this. And when he dies, mm-hmm. uh, by kind of by his own hand because he caused that pole to fall on him his last second he doesn't scream or try to run he just like shuts his eyes and lowers his head like yeah, yeah he just he just kind of accepts it yeah uh, he's, he's already kind of I, you know at that point i think he's realizing that his plans failed he's not willing to do to try and that's interesting and uh yeah my favorite but, moment in the entire series is shifu facing tai lung yeah, Shifu is, facing tai lung i i have that track <laughs> that i that yeah, i bought well, the google music, play the fight the dialogue and just you know, Shifu's kind of that most of that fight. He's in denial. Like, I, it's not my fault that this happened. And and you know, he's pointing he's pointing out like you drove me train this. I love that part where he's like, "Tell me how proud you are." <laughs> Tell me. You were not meant to be the dragon warrior. That was not my fault. Not your fault. Who filled my head with dreams? Oh, who drove me to train until my bones cracked? Who denied me my destiny? What I ever did, I did to make you proud. Tell me how proud you are, Shifu! Tell me! Tell me! And finally, only when Shifu is like, he just can't fight anymore, he's like, ah, I fucked up. Yeah, he did. But he, he, admits, he, he admits that he's he, that he, he that he's sorry. He admits that, yeah. that Tai Long, that he built Tai Long to be this monster, up to that point, even willing, Up to that point, he's not willing to take that responsibility and admit it. Mm-hmm. And you know, and when he finally reaches what's about, what he thinks it's about these last moments, he's finally willing to go like, you know what, I I, I screwed up. You are absolutely yep. right. It's a very strong dynamic going from Master Shifu and his pride as a very skilled and and wise and, and also and supposedly impatient uh, grand master of kung fu. Yeah. Then seeing him kind of. Kind of destroyed by the end of uh, by by the movie's end, and it's it's a mix of seeing Tai Long kind of get what he wants, and but uh, and, and and that's kind of in that it's kind of uh, I don't want to say it's enjoyable because I mean it was cool to watch, but at the same time it's kind of cathartic being able to see Tai Long get this far and be able to get um, and be able to say. I uh, this is what I want. Where is the dragon scroll? You filled right. the head with dreams and you took it away from me. Yeah, and then and, you know when he does get what he wants, he doesn't understand it. Yeah, and actually, we, we you know we've gone through all this without really talking about the main character. Oh, because, oh yeah. uh, well, we all know what Poe is. But, <laughs> yeah, I, no, I think fun. it's something to, to ponder about when you know talking about our um, eating crow. Mm-hmm. Poe could just so easily just come off as obnoxious. I yeah. like Jack Black, but just a character like that who's a big. Goofy fanboy and it hard, it often just take things seriously. Mm. Actually, it's someone who get on your nerves so easily, but they 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 all it's put together in a way where it's endearing. Like he actually does care about these situations. He does. He does care. And he at the same time, he's just a big kid. He's just a big kid, but he's also self aware that he's a big kid. He's very conscious of. Well, he's 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 very conscious in a serious sense of what. His limitations yeah, are because the fact, yeah, when, if, when when you get to final confrontations, things are more serious. He mm-hmm. he knows the right moments to be to play it straight and when to just throw a little. Like I love when he's um throwing the cannonballs back at the end of the Panic Two. That's the big triumphant moment. And there's that moment where he just does the I'm watching you to Shen. Yep. Yeah, and, and Chris just walked away for a second. I'm sorry, right here. I I just stood up to grab the Kung Fu Panda discs on my my disc set that I have, and I wanted the to make Blu-rays, the DVDs. Yeah, the um the the Blu-rays. I wanted to make sure that I got the director's name correctly when uh, uh for Je- Kung Fu Panda Two. Oh, her name's uh, I'm gonna look it up. Yeah, Jennifer, Jennifer Jen- Young or something. Yep, Jennifer Young Nelson. Or Jennifer Young Nelson. Yeah, and then there was a third director, a co-director on three, and that was his first film uh, for directorial. Yeah. And um, Yo, I think she did work on the first one. She was okay. She was head of story on the first one. So uh, yeah, she yeah. I think start. She, uh, she was either head of story or the anim- I think she was animation supervisor. I'm not sure. She's played multiple roles. I think according to her filmography. So I'm gonna go through everything. She was a story artist for Dark City. She was mm-hmm. story artist for Spirit, Stallion the Cimarron, and Madagascar. Head mm-hmm. of story for Sinbad and the first Kung Fu Panda. She doesn't have anything oh. else listed for the first. And then director slash co-director for two and three. So okay. 
I uh, I think that's that that's her her role on those movies. That's fine. I thought I thought I read something different when I was reading the credits, um, but that's cool. But uh, I just wanted to say that I love Kung Fu Panda One. I yeah. think I, I I put it above any other Kung Fu Panda in the series. Yeah, same. However, I do think that Kung Fu Panda Two is the best film in the series. Subjectively, I like Kung Fu Panda One, but I, uh, on a technical level. I think in terms of pacing, I think in terms of introducing a, a bunch of new characters and giving the Furious Five their due and giving Poe more, Growth. <clears throat> getting him some more nuance in his past. I think Kung Fu Panda 2 is better than the other three. I just like one more because she there's more Shifu in it. And yeah, Shifu no, no. I, I was remember, my, um, I actually think 2 has some pacing issues in the first 20 ah. minutes. Uh, and I can't place exactly why, but it's not bad or anything. And once you know, once the full mission in the city's underway, that's that's out the window. And I actually remember even when I saw it and reviewed it, I was like, man, I wish there was more Shifu. But at the same time, he he finally settled, you know, his the, his his lifelong conflict in the first movie. Yeah. And I guess they didn't. I, they probably felt that like trying to force him to go to the city might not work, feel as uh, organic. That's, that was a pretty, uh, that was a balancing act in and of itself. Yeah. You start introducing a bunch of new characters, someone's going to get the shot. Yeah, and he so got more free time in three. Uh, it's, he still didn't like, it was so reduced, but I still felt it was the appropriate amount for, since there was more stuff going on back in the hometown than in two. Two, like they, oh, we got to talk about Mr. Ping. That's his name, right? Pose uh, Goose Dad. Oh yeah, Goose Dad. I love him. I love, <laughs> I love him. Yeah. He's such a lovable, that's another lovable do- goof. Just so his enthusiasm for what he does, his unbridled love for Poe, yeah. and I just love that moment at the end where, like, before Poe comes back, like he's kind of snaps at a point, like I don't know where he's, I don't know if he's safe. <laughs> like he's just that lovable, you know, goofy dad that I think we all have had or known at some point. I think two and three do a good job of est- establishing his inner needs of being oh, a father. Oh. He's a, he's he gets the most he he's a bigger part of three than the other two because yeah, um because you know, he has to. I was so worried leading leading up to it that they would like make a mistake with how Poe you know dealt with him like if he'd leave him for the panda dad yeah he did the right decision kind of just immediately established no you're both going to be be important there's, to me. There's, there's room in his life for 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 two dads, which yeah, is fine. Yeah, and I actually did uh, love. What was his panda dad's name? Lee Shen or something? I don't know something. I, I'm uh, gonna look Brian it up. Cranston. Uh, it's right here. <laughs> Brian Cranston one. Um, Cranston was really good in that. He was because going in, you probably think you know everybody thinks of Walter White and stuff, and he's just. But you you know we tend to forget Malcolm in the Middle and like the voice acting he did before. So Brian he is Cranston's also been, like he uh, he's more mature, but he's those, also kind of a okay. It's Lee Shan is his name. Yeah, for he's those also kind of a goofball. Game. Like you can totally tell like this is going to be Poe in a couple decades. He's yeah. not going to be geeking out as much, but he's still going to be a fun loving, light hearted guy. Yeah. And, and um, I Brian went, Cranston's been doing voice work for a long yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Before before anybody knew he was in Malcolm in the Middle, he was he was in anime. He was on Power Rangers. Yeah, he was in what? Uh, not Robotech. What was that one? Was no, it was, Across think, Plus? Was it? He was in the Street Fighter Two movie. Ah, I didn't know that. He was. Uh, hang on, I'm gonna look it up right here. Brian Cranston filmography. Uh, he was uh, Fei Long. Oh, okay, that's cool. Also in Winds of Onyames. Uh, yeah, okay, he was in Macross Plus as Izamu Alva Dyson. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Armitage 3, that's another anime I've heard of. Then he kind of, that's when he mainly, at that point, he transitioned to, oh, he's in Saving Private Ryan. I've never seen that movie. Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, another great recent voice role of his. Did you see Batman Year One? Uh, no, I didn't see that. That is an interesting one nope, because it's more, I did. it's it's more it's uh, more Commissioner Gordon's story. Ah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, do, I do remember seeing that, yes. He's Gordon in that, and he's great. Yeah, that's cool. I didn't know that, that he was Gordon. That's awesome. Yeah. He still does voices occasionally. Oh, he was also in Madagascar 3, speaking of uh, DreamWorks. Nice. Um, and what else has he done voices in lately? Oh, we probably have to speed this up a bit. I got to stop yeah. him. Okay. Oh, so moving on to remember what we said, like, I know you uh, you don't like the third anywhere near as much, right? Um, Where I love Kung Fu Panda 1 and Kung Fu Panda 2, I only like Kung Fu yeah. Panda 3. Tell me why, because I have two things that make it my least favorite, too. My, my biggest – I do have a bunch of gripes um, with ones? Kung Fu Panda 3, but my biggest one, uh, just for the sake of time, is definitely Kai. Yeah. Kai, oh, my God. They Kai, dropped the ball hard on the villain. Yeah. Kai was a great villain that I think could have been saved for the series. Um, however, I don't think that Kai represented uh, as much as a terrible, cunning, or even a potentially dangerous force – to the Kung Fu Panda world. I believe I mean, that he was a- dangerous. The problem was 
he was not fleshed out. He was not memorable. There was no tragic backstory to him. They just get this brief thing like he was a colleague of Ugwe's, then he got tainted by the power of Chi, and, and they don't really establish why, and, you know, it, his main trait is that people don't know who he is. You must be the dragon warrior. And you must be Kai. Beast of vengeance, maker of widows. Yes, finally. Thank you. Almost makes me want to spare your life. They tried very hard to shoehorn the fact that Uwe saw him as a brother, which I'm like, okay, good for them. But you don't really see the things that made Kung Fu Panda 1 and 2 so frightening with its villains is that other characters reacted with fear or disdain yeah. or disgust to those villains. Yeah. In large portions, uh, with, with Lord Chen, like the wolves cowered at Lord Chen. And, yeah. and, and peacocks are just, they're just food for uh, for predatory yeah. animals um, really. one of my favorite my favorite like ice cold moment in the series is in two the death of the wolf boss where it's like yeah. again it. no razor yeah. to the neck like, just just daggers in his wolf. chest I'm like oh man not wolf man i liked him um uh, shen represented a a kind of really bitter and angry and in some ways kind of hand of justice seeking for itself kind he was of someone who would not let the past go they kind of yeah. understand like Poe's willing to let things go by the end Shen would yeah. never, never and, and where Tai Long saw where Tai Long saw himself as a hero in his story or where Lord Shen saw himself as someone who's justified in what he was doing Kai with all the characters that kind of heard his name they were just like, who the hell is this guy? Yeah. Like, what it yeah. did was and, it made... But the other thing about, me about him is that he's voiced by J.K. Simmons, who is great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I and we know he's a great voice actor. I've seen him in Legend of Korra. He's yeah, been yeah. Yellow Man M for decades. But I've yet to see him in an anime movie that really takes advantage of him, because he's also the mayor in Zootopia for, like, two minutes. Yeah. Uh, the problem with Kai is, unfortunately, is that in Kung Fu Panda 3, he's made into a petty villain, a, a villain yeah. that uh, that feels like that no one knows him because of Uwe, because Uwe betrayed him. But now, yeah. uh, and he's trying to take what he wants and get what he what he feels he deserves. But it's not is not done with the presence or with the ferocity of the other two villains, yeah. which in and of I itself, it, go ahead. In and of itself, it might be a little unfair to compare the two. Yeah. Uh, to Kai, but nonetheless, Kai doesn't come off as he leaves a, little impact. He doesn't come off as a um, as a character with, with a tragic nature um, to him. With with dynamic. Yeah. Th- Any sort of inner conflict. Yeah. Where where Tai Long and Sh- Lord Shen had very brief but important moments where they could turn back from yeah. the path. Kai was just like, I want to turn everybody into po- to puppets. <laughs> yeah. okay, we're running low on time, so I also want to bring up the other thing that I thought the first two were great at, and the third that's on its own. They the first two each have a really, really impactful emotional moment. The first yes. one it is Shifu versus Tai Long. The second is Poe finally remembering his mother. Like that is so sad. And yeah. especially when you find out in the third, yeah, she didn't make it. The third doesn't have her have that. They in fact they just literally replay the moment of the mom being remembered. They never really try to have make their own moment equivalent to that. It yeah. have they, they're good at the other. So other than Kai, and that they're good at the other ingredients: the humor, the imagination, mm-hmm. the action, the. The char- some of the other character dynamics, but I've, they're missing what I feel are two of the best things about the first two movies. Well, to Three's credit, it did try to bring out that emotional kind of theme, but it only played very, very, very briefly. And it was yeah. when Ping and Poe's dad kind of, um, they kind of had their understanding that they could yeah. both be in that Poe's was, life. That was the best <laughs> character dynamic of Three, which was, because uh, Mr. Mr. Ping was so resistant uh, yeah. about, I'm not forgetting his name, Lee Shan or whatever, and, you know, over time, especially when, you know, they start talking about the mom and just, you know, them trying to do the best for Poe, they, and I love that by the end, they're, they're like tag teaming, like, yeah, and I thought that, to accept each other. I actually think uh, the, the panda did accept him, but it was Ping who needed the warming up. Yeah, uh, but I think that um, Kung Fu Panda 3 kind of uh, is, is just lacking in what the other two Kung Fu Pandas had. And I think, uh, I think in that Art. it's just because the one in, it's just because one in two may have already gotten what they wanted out of the barrel and three is kind of just like taking what's left uh, yeah which makes me worried if they do a fourth which they probably will and mm-hmm. they said they, you know they said they want to keep it going nothing's been confirmed yet but i do know like if i watch a fourth or fifth if they ever get to a point where i walk out like just going like it's okay instead of really good to great i'll mm-hmm. just skip it whatever comes next at least in theaters yeah I mean, look look what happened to ice age yeah 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 That's and now we get and, and shrek 
Yeah. Already by a third one, and now we're getting a fifth apparently. Just yeah, whatever. it's going to be it's it's going to be very mm, tricky. It, it's going to be very very tricky in seeing where uh, where Kung Fu Panda goes from this point. I mean, I'm enjoying the three movies that came out, and I yeah. really like three. I think, yeah, no, three is really good. Just the weakest of the three. Yeah, I think I think on its own, it's visually still amazing. It still retains uh, a good dose of the humor that the other two had. Absolutely. I just, I just think that at um, at that point in the series, there's just not enough to keep it going, and and DreamWorks probably just um, needs a break at this point, just to be able to hone in on you know how how they can bring it back to where it was. We will, I mean, we'll see what happens, and yeah, I do want to make it clear. I think we're both recommending all three movies, not oh, just definitely. one and two. Uh, yes. I still really enjoyed three. Please support um, those. Please support those artists. Go go to yes. your nearest <laughs> go to your nearest DVD store and pick it up. Please or buy it on iTunes or something. These are these are movies worth your time and money. If yeah, you like animation. Yeah. If you like family movies too, just they're they're great family movies. That's that's that kind of family movie that I think the whole family can get something out of it. Kung Fu Panda One is definitely on my top ten list of favorite films ever. But I wouldn't be fair to Kung Fu Panda One if I didn't recommend two or three in that. Yeah. Re- Either. I don't know if we're doing my top ten, up. but um, top twenty animated films possibly. I actually need to sit down and make my number my my list someday. I, I know. I mean, I do know number one's always going to be Iron Giant, which I think mm-hmm. we need to talk someday. Okay, we can only do that. I would like it for it to be a video, actually. What would you like for what? I would like for it to be a video, actually, if we can. A video review or something? No, a video of us talking about our top ten favorite films. Oh, oh, oh I think we're talking about Iron Giant. Yeah, I think we can work on that in the future. But um, I think we are – our set time to end is coming to a close. Cool. So thank you again for yeah, making a really good pick to talk about. No problem. Um, I suspect next week we'll have more to say about Final Fantasy XV, mm-hmm. uh, maybe some other stuff. And uh, I will – I think we're going to make it a thing where we just let people know what will, uh, will be the review topic next week. Okay. Next week we are going to tackle the cult Kids WB animated series Freakazoid. Awesome. Uh, I am very excited to revisit this show. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chris is intrigued to revisit it. Intrigued. Yeah, because it's been a while. And Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think he's quite as in love with it as me. But it's going to be a fun discussion because there is very little else like Freakazoid, for better or for worse. I'm very open to it. So we'll have fun when we have it. But for now, thank you for listening to Sketch Watch Play. I'm John Fleury. And I'm Christopher Wade. And we wish you good day. (laughs) Good day, guys. Thanks for joining us.